of y'all mics needed batteries.
Pilgrim Valley. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah, God. Thank you for another day, God. Thank you for having our right minds, God. We got the activities of our limbs. We can walk in here. We can get in here after we got through that door. So we just give God praise this morning. Hallelujah. There's a song that says, His name is above every name. He is worthy of all of our praise. Mighty are the works of his hands. So let's just praise God. Anybody need a miracle today? You need God to just come in and just do some things, right? So let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. He is the God of miracles. Hallelujah. This is our encore performance from the other night. Face. This is 
just a test. It won't last for days. With you, it's gonna be alright. Show us and try it. Come to make you strong. Keep on believing. You keep holding on. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Your blessing. For your blessing. Get ready. Get ready. Your miracle. For your miracle. Get ready. Get ready. Your blessing. For your blessing. Get ready. Get ready. Put your name on it. Put your name on it. God's got a blessing. 
got a blessing. God's 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 got a blessing. With your name on it. What is for you yeah. is for you. Yeah. Hold on. Yes, Lord. So because we can trust him, we're just going to give him ourselves today. Yeah. This song says, I give myself away. So you
preacher pastor needs a Reverend Levinsky Smith. Amen. Amen. He has just, uh, he's just a gifted uh, a man, gifted preacher, gifted to the body of Christ. Amen. We uh, thank God again. Flew in late Friday. We went over there to the banquet on Friday night. And then I had another uh, engagement. I got home in the wee hours of this morning from last night. And so, but here we are. Thank God again. I want to present him and I want to look at 2 Timothy 4 chapter real quick where Paul tells his young uh, protege Timothy he says I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ he says who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom he simply says preach the word don't preach good ideas don't preach what the folks are saying don't preach gossip don't preach rumors don't preach the latest uh, whatever you read he said preach the word be in instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fable but he tells Timothy in verse 5 but watch thou in all things endure affliction he says, do the work of an evangelist and make full work of thy ministry. Yeah. And you have to agree that Pastor Brother Smith, Pastor Smith, Reverend Smith, he makes full proof of it. That means yeah. give it everything. And every part that you uh, affiliated with, your teaching, your preaching, whatever you do, he says, make sure you give it everything you have. And so I'm just proud to stand to introduce him, to present him to you today. I know we're going to be blessed by the word of God. And I know when he gets through, we'll say, what a mighty God we serve. I said it on Friday night. Amens don't cost a whole lot. Matter of fact, just say amen one time. You see how that felt? Amen just says, that's it. So if you hear the word of God, say amen. Encourage him. I always say, saying amen to a preacher. Like saying, sick him to a dog. <laughs> amen. Pastor Smith. It's in your hands. Just 
mic on. There we go. Thank you, Pastor Green. I appreciate very much your kind words of introduction. It is a privilege and a blessing to be able to be in the house of the Lord this morning, to hear the praises of the Lord sung, to revel in the truths of his word, to enjoy the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. What a blessing it is to be in this place. As one of the disciples, it's good to be in this place. I mean, this, this is the right place to be. Well, I'm privileged to share with you this morning. And if you have scriptures with you, please turn to the 46th number of Psalm. Psalms 46. Many thanks to our musicians and singers this morning for helping create a, an appropriate atmosphere for worship, but also for listening. You see, we would be um, incomplete if we came into the house and didn't come not only to speak words of praise, but to listen to words of truth, to hear words of truth from God that can speak to the needs of our soul and nourish the soul within us because truly we cannot live by bread alone. Psalm 46, the text verses will be verses 10 and 11, though we will, through the message, share from the remainder of the psalm. But our text verses are two, verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Please be seated. Sociologists and psychologists are reporting research indicating that we're having an emotional epidemic of both fear and loneliness. People are severely lonely in greater and greater numbers, even among our young people. Even though they are around folks, there is still an experience of aloneness, of emptiness and lack of fulfillment. And what's interesting is many of us have heard about fear and, and the anxieties that are being acerbated by uh, the pandemic, economic conditions, political conditions, war around the world, fear that, that, can, that anxiety that just kind of grips you because you're hearing bad news all the time and you're struggling with issues in your own life, afraid and lonely is a rough place to be. I mean truly rock and a hard place when you are fighting those. But I had not understood just how much loneliness can be detrimental to the individual soul, individual person. According to a study done in 2015, loneliness is likely to increase your risk of death by 26%. Loneliness, living alone and poor social connections are as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness is worse for you than obesity. This was from a 2010 study. Loneliness and social isolation are associated with increased risk of developing coronary heart disease and stroke. Loneliness increases high blood pressure. And the list goes on. We won't go down the list of blues, but Loneliness is, can be devastating when a person feels that there's just not a purpose. There's just not a, a meaningful life for them. They want something they don't have that's not close to them. But I want to testify to you today, because of the Lord, I'm not alone. nor am I fearful. And I want to ask this question to us today. How does one go from afraid and lonely to assured and loved? 
How does one go from afraid and, and lonely where the anxiety is just eating you up and you're trying drugs, you're trying alcohol, you're trying busyness, but busyness is not productive always. Sometimes busyness is just another preoccupation. How does one go from afraid and lonely to assured and loved? The answer is in the stillness. The answer is in the stillness. That's what I'd like to call these thoughts this morning. Stillness. What does that even mean? The Lord said at the beginning of the first verse of the text, be still. Be still. Y'all know, everybody that's a parent, <laughs> you probably couldn't count the number of times you've used that directed at somebody else. Usually the small two to three feet guy. <laughs> be still. But God's using that not to speak to small infants who are fidgety and, and anxious and trying to move around a lot. The Lord is speaking that word to the world. The context of the 46th Psalm, and it, when you read it, some commentators describe it as being a national psalm about the relationship of the nation of Israel to the Lord and that they didn't need to be afraid of anybody around them and that God was telling, when he said, be still, he's telling his enemies, y'all better be still. <laughs> I'm in charge. I'm the one that's going to be exalted. And you're going to be afraid. And you're the ones that are going to be put down. But when you study this passage in its entirety, it's clear God means this not just to speak to the enemies of a nation, but God uses the entirety of this psalm to speak to the minds and hearts of his own people who find themselves struggling with that sense of aloneness, that sense of being separated and unconnected, and that sense of fear, that sense of anxiety of what if what if? How many what ifs could you list? That'd be an interesting exercise, wouldn't it? First, you know how your teachers used to ask you to take out a piece of paper? Take out a piece of paper and a pen and just start listening. What if? And put dot, dot, dot and fill in whatever comes to your mind and see how many what ifs you can list about issues in your life. And some of us are wondering, what if? I don't get that job? What if I get fired from the one I got? What if my spouse leaves me? What if the rain comes and we don't have the roof on yet? What if my car breaks down while I'm on this trip? What if the plane has trouble while I'm in the air? What if I catch that disease that's going around? What if all of those things can come into your mind and they can aggravate that nervousness in us, triggering that flight or fight mechanism that is built into human beings from little bitty that creates and puts cortisol into our system and causes us to get stressed and maybe even a little bit of adrenaline and we're ready to do something, but when we don't have to do something, it just kind of eats us on the inside. And it messes with the mind and it messes with the body. But God doesn't want his people living like that. You know what happens when you get to know the Lord? When you get to know what God put in his word for you? You don't worry so much about what if. Because you find out from the assurance that God's truth provides that you can look at every what if and answer it with two words. Even if. Even if, even if I lose this job, even if they leave me, even if I get that disease, even if 
My God is with me. And I am assured of his presence and of his power. And I am assured of his care and his love for me. I can be assured in the stillness. Be still. What does that mean? Well, obviously when we're referring to somebody else, we want them to stop <laughs> whatever it is they're doing. We want them to listen, take notice, learn, maybe evaluate, hopefully decide to do something wise. But where do we find the answer for stillness when the Lord tells us to be still? We can find it right here in this passage, in this full psalm of these 11 verses. One of the things that's obvious about being still is the first, the first thing that's obvious is requires a cessation of activity. Physical activity slows or stops. When, when something is still, if it's on wheels, it's going to quit rolling. If it's on legs, it's going to stop walking. Whatever it's doing will cease. It's going to enter into a state of immobility. It's not going to move. God wants us to get in a state where we're not just agitated and moving around and busy. He wants us to be still, to stop our physical activity. The Sabbath principle is still active. The Sabbath principle God gave that said on six days he created the universe and on the seventh day God rested. And he established the Sabbath day and said keep it holy. And what he said, thou shalt do no servile work. In other words, stop. Be still. <laughs> you need to listen to me. You need to think about your life. You need to think about where you are. You need to focus on truth. And that's the second thing about stillness and being in the stillness. You, you got to stop. You know, sometimes we want to keep doing stuff when we shouldn't be doing stuff. We get into this myth of the, of the uh, multitasking. You know, but even though you think you're doing two things at once, you're just doing two things slower <laughs> and not as well. And God deserves to be a one-task moment in your life. The time you spend with God shouldn't be doubled up with the TV. The time you spend with God shouldn't be doubled up with your exercise. The time you spend with God should be his. You need to sit in front of him and be still. And what is that going to involve besides eliminating the motion? You've got to take some steps on the inside. It has to do with mental activity as well. You've got to mentally focus on truth to be still in the sense that God is encouraging us to do. Mentally focus on truth. Now note this, truth is different than facts. Facts are just things that are true. Truth is something that is both true and eternal. Truth is bigger than facts. It may be a fact that it's raining outside but it's a truth that God controls the weather. That's a truth. Keeping our minds not just full of facts about individual things that happen, but having our minds dwell on the truth that God reveals to us is what nourishes the soul and causes us to come to a place where our souls calm down on the inside. It's not just that the body stops moving, but the agitation of the mind, the frustrations of the soul will cease. Y'all know what it's, anybody here ever know what it's like to just take a deep breath and exhale when you've been under some stress in the moment 
and you just kind of. One of the most important things I ever learned was how to breathe. You say, Smith, you've been breathing since the day they whacked you on the behind. But you know what? It took a long time for me to figure out I wasn't breathing the best way I could. To understand that there, there is a, a, a proper way to get the full volume of air into your lungs. And what that does, getting that extra oxygen into you, it, it has a calming effect on your whole body. The tension in the neck and the shoulders and the, 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 everything about you just kind of can calm down when you get still and in a moment just breathe deeply from the diaphragm, from down here low, not, not just up here high, but all the way down on the inside. It's a wonderful experience to, to just calm the mind and the heart in those special moments. And the Lord wants us to do that. He wants us to be before him physically still, but also mentally focused on truth. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 26 and 3. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. You see, focusing the mind on the truths that God reveals are the eternal things that will not change. Yeah, I'm out of gas. That's a fact. But you know what? God still loves me. And God still supplies everything I need. And he is going to get me through this situation so that I'm not focused on the facts of the moment. I'm focused on the truths of eternity. And that can change your experience in this life such that you not, are not nearly as subject to fear as you would be otherwise. But also you got to know something. Knowledge is crucial. And knowledge of our relationship to God is the most important knowledge anyone can ever have. Notice in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Do you know that? And you say, well, yeah, of course I know God. I know, I know the Lord is God. But do you know that experientially? Not just as a fact, but do you know that as a personal relationship with him? God doesn't want you to just know his title. God wants you to know him in experience on a personal basis. Knowledge of our relationship to God, understanding the names that one can have for God and with God, is what the Lord describes. Go back to verse 1. Psalm 46. Notice he says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's the kind of knowledge we need of God. God is our refuge and strength. What's a refuge? The Hebrew word there has to do with shelter. It also has a connotation of hope. God is our refuge. And then he says, and strength a very present help in trouble. The strength there is might and power. You know, one of the reasons you're afraid sometimes is because you don't have, you feel weak. You feel vulnerable to the circumstances and people around you. But when you know God and you know that he is present with you, you have full awareness of his capability in your presence. It's amazing the correlation that you will find in Scripture if you'll do a study, and I encourage every one of you to do it, of where God encourages in Scripture his people not to be afraid. You will invariably find a connection between that encouragement to not be afraid and a promise of his presence. Don't be afraid. And when he says for or because, it'll be because he said I'm there. I'm with you. I'm with you. But if 
you just believe in God, but you don't believe he's there. You're not that well, you're, 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 you're not well off. You've got to know that he's there and that he's with you in that tough times. Notice he says, a very present help. The word very is an emphatic term, both in English and in the Hebrew that's used here, describing that when he says a very present, I am, I am really there <laughs> with you right now. We have a right now present God with us who can help us get through whatever situation and circumstance we face. And notice, so we have to know of our relationship, but we need to know of the, that he really cares for us. And that's what he means when he says, I'm a very present help. He is right there with us. And mental focus also requires elimination of distraction, getting rid of all of the the things around us that would take us in our thinking away from believing the truths of God and meditating on the reality of those truths. And that's going to be a challenge because the enemy is going to constantly try to throw stuff at you and say, well, did God really say that? Can you, do you really believe that? And you have to tell him square to his face, yes, he said it, and yes, he meant it, and yes, I believe it. We must not focus, as I said, as I said earlier, on the what ifs. But even if God tells us something different than what we hoped would be true. Notice verse 2. Therefore, why? Therefore, because... God is our refuge because God is our strength, because God is a very present help. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be moved. What if the earth be moved? Doesn't matter. And though the mountains be carried into the sea. What if the mountains be carried into the sea? And I'm telling you, if you read Internet news every day, did you know a comet's coming to the earth? What, did you know that they were likely to get hit by an asteroid within the next 150 years? Did you know that there's going to be a split in Africa and a new ocean is popping up? Did you? I mean, I'm, all of this stuff is out there. The Lord it says, even if the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, doesn't change a thing about my relationship to the Lord doesn't change it one bit. And an important aspect, because this is, this is the whole person relationship. God wants us physically, mentally, and spiritually involved with him. And stillness with God involves all three of those aspects of the human nature. And notice in verse 4, verses 4 and 5, make the point that we need a spiritual desire to be where God is. That's part of the stillness. You see, just getting somewhere by yourself and stopping moving, and just getting somewhere and reading a few Bible verses, that's good, but there needs to, that needs to be accompanied by an internal hunger and thirst and a desire for God's presence. So that it's not just the fact that you got a Bible, and unfortunately, people are reading the Bible much less than they used to. One study I read said that as few as 11% of Americans read the Bible at least once a week. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty bad. Uh, I, I, I won't poll you and ask how many of you read the Bible every day, how many of you read the Bible two times a week. Some of you read the Bible when you come in here and hear it read to you. But the truth is, we need to be hungered and hungry for the truth of God and the presence of God in our life. Spiritual desire to be where God is. Notice verses 4 and 5 that describe the place where God is and what a blessed place it is. And there ought to be something in us that says, that's where I want to be. 
I want to go there. You know how little kids, what were they here about Disneyland or, or some amusement event or something like that? Ooh, 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 ooh. Mama, can we go? Daddy, can we go? But when you think about where God is and where he wants to be with us, you got to want to be there. Notice the writer says, there is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. I'm telling you, that's where you want to be. Yeah, I'm in trouble. Yeah, it's not going like I wish it was. But I can be in the tabernacles of the Lord. I can be in the presence of the Lord through his spirit. I can get in touch with my God and I can go to his secret place. And as David says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I read that and I say, yes, yeah, where I want to go. Yeah, David, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Oh, just one day. Oh, I just want to get there. Oh, Lord, I want to be where you are. That's got to be the heart. Why? Because it's a wonderful place to be. One day we'll be there forever. One day we'll be in his kingdom forever. But until then, we can be there in spirit. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. I'm telling you, that's got to be the heart, is that spiritual desire to be where the Lord is. Our lack of awareness is not conclusive proof of God's absence. You know, the fact that, well, I just don't feel like God's near me. That doesn't mean he's not. Just like you can be in a room with the light off and not know somebody else is in there. And you're wondering, you know, I'm so tired of being alone, but sometimes you just really need to turn the light on and figure out, figure out where you are. You know, some, there's more going on around you than you're aware of. And if you get connected spiritually, turn the light on around you, you'll be much more aware of things God's doing in your life and his presence in your life and his desire to bless you, to fellowship with you, to come into your soul and sup with you. Do you know God wants to do that? Do you know the Lord wants to spend time with you? I'm telling you one of the most precious moments. I've shared this before, but I quickly say it again. I never will forget the time. I just had us. The Lord just seemed like he just said to me, Vince, I want to read 1 John to you. And I, I, I thought, did I just hear that? <laughs> now, I, I put down everything else I needed or had to do, and I went and got my Bible. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I'm going to sit on your lap, and I want you to read this to me. Please, Lord. And you know the Lord wants to do that for us. The Lord wants to abide with us. But too often believers are content with a drive-by wave to God rather than an engaging conversation. You just, you know, kind of stop by every once in a while and wave at him and say, I know who you are. I wish you'd come by my house sometime and fix this. But not stopping, going into his house, coming into his presence where you have been invited, where you have a special relationship with him, all of these things that are described here about the Lord in his special place, that desire to want to be there. And, you know, people will get mad and people can make up stuff they want to do and harm you, but it won't change who God is to you. Notice verse 6. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Meaning the heathen got all upset. They can get mad, but it won't change who God is. God's in charge. And when God does what he wants, he can do what he wants. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And the term refuge there has to do with something that's high not approachable, something that is 
People can't get, the enemies can't get to you. When, you. when you're where the Lord wants you to be and in his presence and in his refuge, the enemy can't get to you. They can throw stuff at you, but it won't reach. They can shoot stuff at you, but it's going to bounce off. Because you're in the Lord's refuge. And he can do that for us. And then the psalmist concludes. And even though this could be read as speaking to the enemies to say, y'all need to know who our God is. Because our God is the biggest, the baddest, the best. You ain't, y'all can't touch him. It's also a statement of God to his people about who he is to them and how he can be trusted with the details of your life. Yes, you can trust God with your salvation and your eternal life, but you know you can trust God with your lunch money. You can trust God with your grocery money. You can trust God with what to do in every situation and circumstance of your life. He wants you to walk with him. In closing, notice these statements. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. And, of course, that that verse is often seen somebody on a poster with a picture of the Grand Canyon, and underneath it it is, look at the desolations, knowing that these magnificent things that God has done to the environment around us, that they are the works of his hands. But that's small potatoes. I mean, little bitty potatoes. That's... We're talking nugget potatoes. Go out at night and get in a dark place and look up into the heavens and behold the heavens and understand that the God you serve is the God that made heaven and earth. The God you made made the sun and all the stars, all the trillions and quadrillions of stars are out there because of the power of God. He created it. By him it was created and for his purpose. And by him, our Savior, Christ Jesus, all things consist. And yes, he knows and has named every one of them. And he knows your name and cares about you. So that the Lord says, He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Yes, God can stop your enemies. God can stop those who have designs for your depression and destruction. But God wants to deal with the war that's going on inside of you. God wants to speak to the wars that's going on in your heart about your present feelings and your circumstances and what's going on with you. Because God wants to speak to the storms in your life and tell them to be still. He can do that. He can do that. I don't know about you, but I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I hope everyone in here has. But maybe there's somebody in here who hasn't. Maybe you've heard a lot about God. You've been in church and you've listened to songs and you've listened to preachers, but you've never yourself had an experience in which you had the experience of God's spirit calling you and saying, you're not one of mine. You don't know me. You know a few things about me. You hear other people talk about me, but you don't know me. And sadly, there are going to be quite a few people, the scripture tells us. Jesus talked to his disciples that one day there will be many, many who say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And he'll say, depart from me. I I never knew you. He didn't say, yeah, you used to come around sometime and we were pretty good friends for a while and you broke it off and, and you know, sorry. No, he's, no, I don't even know who you are. I, we never met. You're, you're, you're not one of mine. That will be a cold experience to have. 
So each one of us need to make sure we've answered the question in our heart and in our mind, am I one of his? When the spirit convicted me of sin, have I repented? Did I tell God I was sorry for the transgressions that put his son on the cross? Have I asked Jesus Christ to become my savior and to forgive me of all my sins and to come into my heart and live in my soul through his Holy Spirit and I will follow him as he leads? Those are questions that each one of us has to answer. But if we can answer those in the positive, God's promises to us are there to make sure that we do not have to live this life alone and afraid. But we can live this life assured and loved. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts, the word hosts is armies or forces. It's not, uh, you know, somebody having parties. The Lord of hosts means God is almighty. And what he says he will do. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So brothers and sisters, we don't have to be alone and we don't have to be afraid. God wants you in his fellowship. He wants you to be assured of his love and know that you're safe. And he wants to know you personally. He wants to know everything about you. Of course, he already does. But he wants you to know he knows. And he wants you to know more about him. That's what's most important. Because the more you know about him, the less it'll matter what you know in this world. Pastor. Let us stand all over this building. Thank God again for God's word. people talk about it, he's like the 911 system. I disagree because scripture says he's a very present help. When we get in trouble, God is already there. No matter what's going on, we don't have to call him because he's very present help. Thank God again for our word this morning. And, 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 I, and I'm looking at it different now, so instead of what if, even if. Amen. Isn't that something? Even if, whatever the storm is, even if, because we serve a God who sits high and lifts slow. Smith, we thank you for that. And well, let's bless him again. Another hand. Thank God again for the word. Amen. What I found out is that faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. All over this building as we stand. Maybe you're here this morning. You have never for whatever reason, experience this relationship that he's told us about. Even in your anxiety and your stress and your anxiousness and your worry, you've never confessed hope in Christ. But you've come. You come to church each week. You periodically you show up and you, you might read your Bible every now and then. You hear people talk about how he made a way. You hear the stories of how he opened Red Seas, how he opened doors, you hear how he fed, but you never really come to know him for yourself. Today, if you're here, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm talking to you this morning. He wants a relationship with you. 
You do know one day, every one of us, we're going to leave this world. But, you know, it doesn't make a difference what you do here. It doesn't make a difference how many accolades you have. The only thing that really makes a difference is did you accept Jesus as your personal Savior? Again, we're going to leave the world. And it's, it's a scary thought to think that we think and we can deceive ourselves and believe that we're saved and we're really unsaved. And to hear the Lord say, depart from me, that I never knew you. You've heard me say this before. You know, I was a kid growing up and we loved to play hide and go seek. You know how it is. You know, somebody, would, I would I always like to be the one to go hide. So my brothers or whoever, cousins, they would go to counting and 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, that, that, that 20, I didn't move because I'm knowing they're getting ready to cut loose now. They say, ready or not, here I come. Do you not know right now the Lord is saying, ready or not? And you keep saying, I'm going to wait until next week. I'll wait until so-and-so show up. I'm going to wait till I got the right clothes on. Or I'm going to wait until such and such. You can put whatever you want to put there. But the Lord is saying, ready or not, here I come. We submit to you, brothers and sisters, that you, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in that heart that God has raised him from the dead, he says, thou shalt be saved. Eternally secured. Never have to wonder. Never question. Don't have to worry about death. Don't have to worry about dying. Don't have to be afraid when you get sick because he's, he's calling you right now. If you're here this morning, you don't know him. We submit to you. If you're here this morning, you walked away from him. You're out of the ark of safety. You just did what you, you do what you want to do. You go where you want to go. You write your own rules. You write your own itinerary. I'm talking to you this morning. Why don't you come wherever you are this morning? Amen. See, do we have one? Do we have another this morning? You're here for baptism. You're here for whatever reason. It's prayer. Thank God again for his word. We're going to pray in just a minute, but when we get ready to pray, I want you to put in prayers, uh, bereaved families, uh, brother Nathaniel Hill, we do uh, know that his brother uh, passed away on last week. In fact, I was getting ready to load, we heard that his brother Robert, the one who was here with us in January, I think it was early part of the year, he passed away. Not only him, but I know brother Oliver lost an aunt on this week. Amen. Just saw Brother Oliver and uh, they will be having a uh, uh, service here on this coming Thursday. Uh, we'll be burying his aunt. Uh, then others who have lost loved ones want to continue to be praying for family members who are in the hospitals. Uh, those who don't know the uh, Lord and say, Robert, we're praying for your mother. We know that she's still in rehab. We're praying for her. If there's someone else here that uh, needs prayer, amen. I wouldn't know the prayer line on Sunday or Friday morning. But we'll be praying for you as well. Amen. 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 What we'll do before we have our prayer, our Brother Dukes is coming. Amen. He's coming back. So he wants to come back and rejoin Pilgrim Valley. Amen. He was a member at one time and uh, he's gone. And so again, uh, we know that he wants to come back in coming under Christian experience. Thank God for him. He's been visiting several weeks now, a month or six, a couple of months or so. And uh, thank God for people who come in and take their time. Don't just jump up and hear one message and you jump up and you decide. But he started out and let God is leading him back uh, this way. We'll let him give a statement, and then once he gives a statement, then we'll have a report we'll submit to the church here. But Duke? Good morning, Chief.
Thank you, Brother Dukes. Amen. We have heard Brother Dukes' statement that he's wanting to come back and rededicate himself to Pilgrim Valley. Amen. And uh, I want to just make one slight correction. He said something that I know what he's mean, but we never wanted to be comfortable. Amen. You, you always want to be stirred up. Amen. I, he enjoys the fellowship. He enjoys all of us together. But prayerfully, when you come in here, you are uncomfortable every Sunday. And you're stirred up to want to make a difference and make a change. Amen. And so after hearing his statement, what is the pleasure of the church? Amen. You got a mask on if you're saying something. Anybody? second by another the brother dukes will come and he will go through our membership orientation and after that we'll have all rights and privileges and responsibilities of each member brother dukes i ask you are you willing to follow me as i follow christ amen and with that being said then what we will uh it's been moved by one second by another the brother dukes will come back under the membership orientation all in favor say aye, aye. all opposed and so as have it we will Thank you. And we will be getting you with your orientation. Thank you, man. All right. Amen. All right. Amen. We'll get ready to have prayer. I want to also uh, keep Sister Carrick in our prayer. She has been admitted to UAMS Hospital as well. I want to be praying for her. And then, for again, I think the uh, Sister uh, Laura Reddick, I think her daughter had a memorial. If they haven't had it, it will be uh, this week if they didn't have it on last week. So we're praying for the Reddick family as well. All right, uh, let us get ready to go to God in prayer. We thank God again for prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, we will get ready to also get ready for our Lord's Supper following this, and then we'll go off into our announcements. Father, we just come right now in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God, for being God. Nobody can be God like you. Thank you for hearing us and responding, God, to our need. We needed a Savior, and you sent your Son, Jesus, the Christ, to 42 generations. Live before us, God. And God, we thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Thank you for the blood that was shed out on Calvary. Thank you, God, for all the great getting up morning where you declared you had all power in heaven and in earth. Thank you, God, that even right now, God, that when we find ourselves in situations that you are with us, you told us that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And even when you left, God, you sent the paracletos back, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, God, who prays for us, who encourages us us God who walks with us who continues God to lead us and feed us God and remind us of all of what your word said thank you for the word of God that we heard on this morning God reminding us God that no matter what we go through God you are still here God you are still continuing to keep us God we love you because you first loved us. We pray right now for our bereaved families this morning, God. All of those members who've lost loved ones, give them the strength they need right now to endure this dark season in their life, God. As the clouds of discomfort set over them, God, the rains, God, of hurt pour down on them, God. We pray that you would give them a healing, God, or touch them in such a way they would know, God, that you have not forgotten about them, God. We pray that you lift up bowed heads, God, that you would just soothe uh, hurting hearts, God, that you, God, would give us a peace of mind, God, that surpasses all understanding, God. We thank you right now for your forgiveness, God. Thank you, God, for loving us when we didn't even love ourselves. Thank you, God, for how you made a way out of no way, God. Thank you for not only that, God, but even right now as we pray. You are making intercession for us, God, and we thank you for being our advocate, God. We ask, oh God, that you would forgive us of our sins, those things that we have said, the places we've gone, the things we have done. We pray that you would forgive us, God. Use us in your service, God. God, we pray that you would continue to allow us to hold up the bloodstained banner of Jesus 
Christ, telling me and women, boys and girls alike, that you are the Christ. You are the Savior. You are the Son of the living God. Thank you right now, God, for what you're doing. Even right now, thank you for the lives that you are touching in this place. And then, God, we thank you for those who have come back. Pray that you continue to stir up the gift in us. God, we realize, God, that we have sinned and come short of your glory. But we know, God, that you are a forgiving God. And when we confess our sins, God, you will forgive us. We pray, God, that you would touch that one who still hasn't made a decision about you, God. Give them, God, the, uh, the, the understanding and knowledge to be able to confess you before it's too late, God. Because one day, every knee will bow. And one day, every tongue will confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, God, we thank you for Pilgrim Valley as a whole. Thank you for our prayer warriors, those who continue to pray and continue to pursue and press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We love you and we thank you. And then, God, we pray for those under the sound of my voice right now, whatever hurt they're going through, whatever trial they're going through, strengthen them, God, that they may be able to look back and see what a mighty God we serve. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to ask deacons, if you all will, go ahead and keep the lights dim. We're going to go ahead and go right into the Lord's Supper while we're up. I'm going to ask our deacons, if you all will, today, come around and just stand out across the front as we get ready to worship in the Lord's Supper. This is a little different this morning. We thank God again for this uh, privilege, this opportunity, and uh, to take part in this ordinance. And we know that the Lord's Supper is always a soul-stirring experience simply because of the depth of meaning uh, that it contains. There are some things that we approach kind of haphazardly, and some things we do just out of tradition. But the Lord's Supper should never be done just haphazardly. It should never be done out of tradition. If you remember, it was uh, during the age-old celebration of the Passover the night that Jesus instituted this fellowship meal that we even observe to this day. And I'll just kind of give a few scriptures throughout. Uh, I won't stay on one particular scripture, but if you remember, uh, as he celebrated the Passover, this was the most sacred feast of the uh, Jewish religious year, which commemorated the final plague on Egypt when the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed and on that night that the Israelites would take the hyssop and they took blood and put over the doorposts of the home so that the deaf angel would pass over uh, this and so they would celebrate the Passover for generations to come. If you remember during the last supper Jesus took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to God and he blessed the bread and then he also took the, the wine he blessed the wine and he told them he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said listen do this in remembrance of me. Not only that, he says, in the same way he took the cup, he also said, this is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And you remember he concluded this feast by going out, Matthew says, and they sung a hymn, which meant they were still celebrating. They were not sad, even though he had said, I'm getting ready to die. That same night, they crucified him. But yet, when they look back and they remember What's, what the Lord's Supper means, we should be able to celebrate. It's not a time of, of depression. It's not a time where we're looking down, we're sad, but we are so grateful that the Lord shed his blood for our sins. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, if it had not been for the shed blood of Jesus, our Christ, we would still be in our sins. Two things Paul added that others did not say. He wrote concerning the Lord's Supper. He said, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, he says, watch this, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, he says that the blood of the Lord, he will be guilty of sinning against the blood of the Lord. He said the man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body or drinks and eats unworthily shall bring damnation to himself. And he's not saying that any of us are worthy. We can't look at ourselves and say, I'm worthy because I preach. I'm worthy because I sing in the choir. I'm worthy because I'm an usher. I'm worthy because I've been in church all my life. What makes us worthy is the fact that we take it with the right motivation, knowing why we're taking it. Uh -huh. So as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper this morning, one thing he reminds us, he says, one of the reasons that many of us 
are sick is because of the way we take we approach the Lord's table. Mm. He said the reason we we're sick, sick and the reason is so many sleep. And he's not talking about just taking a nap and you wake up after you've got rest. He said the reason many are asleep is because we are taking the Lord's Supper in the wrong way. Y'all know Reverend Smith does this so diligently that he can just <laughs> explain how you bend the tab back and you drop this down and you do all of that. And every time I get here, I struggle with this. I'm just going to go to a piece of bread. <laughs> no. And, uh, no, I'm serious, y'all. I'm, I'm just having to. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tell him, say, your hands are too big for one thing. <laughs> you need some help. Amen. Amen. I always get the one that don't work right. And so, again, as we, we're celebrating celebrating thank God all right does everybody have the elements and so as we eat and we drink together we remember the sacrifice that was paid on our behalf let us eat and let us drink together get ready to prepare to give as you come to give you can bring your trash up to the front as you walk around to give so I'm going to ask that everybody would get up and walk around if you don't mind our giving is a sign of our relationship with Jesus Christ you know and we don't give to give we give because of our relationship, because of what he's already given us. Amen. Let us get ready to our ushers. I was gonna have him walk around. Y'all don't mind ushers. Y'all just go ahead and go back. Sister Penny. We're gonna let them walk around. running again. That's what the Lord wants. Cheerful givers. Amen. have any birthdays this week? Any birthdays this week? Or we just had it in May. Amen. Got birthdays this week. All right. Amen. Birthdays this All right. All right. We're going to do something this month different than we've been doing. I got something I was going to have on you for the screen, but we're going to uh, just say for those who got a birthday, go ahead and stand anyway. 
And we just want to tell you happy birthday to you on this week. Amen. I'm going to do something a little bit different on next week, a little bit untraditional. Some of y'all going to like me, some of you ain't going to like me next week, but that's all right. But uh, we're going to do something a little different on our birthday. Y'all looking at me real strange, like what is he up to? Amen. But we're going to celebrate our birthdays again each week, and we're going to celebrate it just a little bit different. All right? Amen. Amen. Let us, uh, is that all, all of our announcements? We have any announcements, anything this week? The 13th, don't forget this coming uh, Saturday at, is it 12 o'clock? Saturday at 12 o'clock, the Young Lions, they will be presenting and they will have a luncheon for the mothers and the women uh, this Saturday. So come on out, and I know they're going to feed you real good. Come out and get you a good measure on uh, Saturday for Mother's Day. Don't forget, Mother's Day is next Sunday, and we'll be celebrating our mothers. Those are here, those are gone. Amen. And then those who you want to be mothers, come on still anyway. Amen. All right. Do we have any... Uh, Browning. He said Alexander Youth Ministry is going out at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So those who want to go over there, make sure uh, you be present this evening. All right. Anything else? We got two graduates, William and Madison State, and are graduating from Mills High School. Amen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Where they at? They're not in here. We get them. We get them. We go to. Amen. So some more. Yes. Yes. Amen. Right. Look at God. Amen. Amen. I tell folk all the time, Pilgrim Valley got some smart members. Amen. I mean that. I don't say that, but we got we got members. It like educated members. Amen. So it's fountain. Amen. That's Amen. right. Next Saturday, from Pulaski Tech, he's getting his associate. I think in the computer science, computer engineering. But I know it will be. Yes. Next. Where is it? Where is it? UALR. Oh, it will be at Pulaski. Oh, Barton Coliseum. That's right. Okay. Thank you for that. I, that totally slipped my mind. So thank you, Jordan. Amen. Little Jordan. I tell you, buddy, young folks are growing up. Wow. Well, Madison, I mean, I'm telling you, look at God. Amen. All right. That being all, no more announcements. Brother Diggs, who, where y'all pointing at? She already graduated. Oh, she's going to graduate. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. We're in that season, y'all. Let's definitely continue to keep our graduates in prayer. Amen. And, you know, it used to be a time they say, get your, your, get your high school diploma. You're all right now. You need to go further than that. Don't just let them stop at high school. Go as far as they can go. Get as much as they can. So we want to encourage them. All right. That being all, don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. And, uh. Then before we do it, we'll have Reverend Smith come back and close us out with our final remarks and our benediction. Amen. Also, we're praying this evening. They're going to be having the uh, uh, annual scholarship banquet for Sister D, where they presented to the students for Sister Dorsine Hill. And that'll be at 2 o'clock this evening. So we're praying for that as well. God bless everyone. Please stand. A wonderful blessing from the Word of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Most gracious Lord, we bow before you and give thanks to you for your goodness in this day. Thank you for the fellowship we've enjoyed in your house. Help us, Lord, to leave from this place, but not from your presence. To go, Lord, where we will continue to seek you out and to be close to you, and to walk in your path. Father, we thank you. We praise you for all your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let us all say.